Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess. by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. The Lord be with you. We pray, O oh God, 
You taught the hearts of your faithful people by sending to them the light of your Holy Spirit. By that same Spirit, give us a right judgment in all things that we may have and always rejoice in his holy comfort. We ask it through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading is from the 37th chapter of the book of prophecy from Ezekiel. He speaks of the valley of the dry bones. The hand of the Lord was upon me and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley and it was full of bones. And he led me around them. And behold, there were many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied there was a sound and behold a rattling and the bones came together bone to its bone. And I looked and behold there were sinews on them. The flesh had come upon them and skin covered them but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, my son, from a man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost, and we are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. The recitative psalm for today is 139. O Lord, you have searched me and known me, You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Where shall I grow from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, if I say, surely the goodness shall cover me and the light about me be night, glory be to the Father and to the Son. in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The epistle reading is from the second chapter 
of the Acts of the Apostles, according to Luke. When the Pente day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared from them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear, each of us, in our own native language? Parthians and Medes, Emilites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in their own tongues the mighty works of God, and we're all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. Give ear to my words, for these men are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was ordered, uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and young men shall see visions, and old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire, vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. 
Now we hear the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 15th chapter. Jesus says, But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you've been with me from the beginning. But I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where, have you, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to, to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes... He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare that to you. All that the Father has is mine, therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And this is the gospel of the Lord. Praise now we join our voices as we confess our commonly held faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I You may be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in God the Father and in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The Word of God that engages us in meditation this morning, that's uh, the fantastic prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 37. Particularly, I'm focusing on those words which might just be the most ridiculous question ever placed on the face of the planet. Can these bones live? I say it's ridiculous because it doesn't take too much effort to know that once something dies, it's gone. You've experienced that certainly in your own lives. You've experience the loss of a loved one who maybe now is just bones in the ground. And um, uh, there's, there's no getting around it. Everything is falling apart. And bones, very dry bones, well, they don't come to life. It doesn't take much. It's, it's something that's been known since Cain killed Abel. Dead is gone. So for, for God to place the question to the prophet Ezekiel, can these bones live? Preposterous. And Ezekiel, to his credit, has the wisdom not to answer. <laughs> you know, O oh Lord, you know. Um, the, the question comes to Ezekiel because Ezekiel is a prophet sent by God with a message of hope 
to an entire nation, uh, Israelites, who have been exiled from their land, exiled from Jerusalem, exiled from the land of their inheritance. They've been led off by their noses into a miserable existence in Babylon. Meanwhile, Jerusalem and Judea and Israel, the land of promise, is now owned and occupied by Babylonians, by a pagan culture that has no respect for the God of the Bible, has no cognizance of any kind of promise of a Messiah. It's just a pagan world. It's really a culture of death. And these poor Israelites in Babylon are looking at one another and more than that, they're looking then at their children and now they're looking at their children's children and they're starting to say, our own grandchildren are starting to look more like Babylonians than Israelites. All of Israel was dead, or at the very best, dying. They saw it in themselves. They were a dying people, a dying culture, a dying race, a dying religion, a dying nation. They were a valley of dry bones. This is what led them to to write that psalm where they say, By the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and we wept. There on the poplar trees, we hung up our harps. Because there, our captors, the Babylonians, demanded songs of joy from us, jeering at us, taunting us, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. But how can we sing the songs of Zion when we're in a foreign land, exiled? Into that death, God sends the prophet Ezekiel with a prophecy of hope. That somehow, by the Spirit of God, he is able to make dry bones live. That's the message that goes out from Ezekiel to these Israelites living in captivity, living in exile. And it's an incredible message. I mean, it's, it, it's not just an, a ridiculous question. It is the question that has plagued humanity ever since Cain slew Abel. Can these bones live? And it's really, uh, you know, it's the same situation that that Adam and Eve must have found themselves in. Certainly, they had just been exiled. Right? They'd been clean cut off, like Ezekiel says in the text. They'd been clean cut off from the tree of life. Only they ever have known, only Adam and Eve ever knew what it was like to walk in that garden and to know I've been made to live forever. They knew that. They experienced it. They lived it. Their life inside the garden was an eternal life. And they lost it because of their sin. And the result of that sin, it doesn't have to be explicitly stated. It's implicit. They are clean cut off. They're cast away from the tree of life. And now there's a guardian standing there with a sword as if to say the only entry back into this place is through death. Clean cut off. And now I'm imagining Adam and Eve. Exiled from life. Now they're in a a dying culture. The, the, The laws of thermodynamics have taken over. Adam and Eve are dying. And I can picture them looking at each other. Now they've given birth to a couple of sons. And they're asking themselves, how are our children ever supposed to know 
that they were born to live forever. How are they supposed to know what it's like to live forever? They can't experience what we had. I can imagine Adam and Eve looking at each other, looking at their teenage boys saying, I, <laughs> oh boy. They're, 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 they look more like the culture of death than the life that we understood and loved and lived in that garden. And so, the culture of death takes over and Cain kills Abel. And even though his blood is crying out from the ground, which is in, in a sense a, a prophecy that indeed dead bones can yet live, even so, Adam and Eve, they seem to have lost everything. Now they've lost Abel. Now they've lost Cain. What's left? They're looking at their family saying, what is coming to this place? And the Israelites in Babylon are looking at their families and saying, what is coming to this place? And does any of this start to sound familiar? Have you looked out the window lately? at the culture of death or worse. And I can say I experienced this too in my family. You start to look at those whom you love and you start to say they look a little bit more like Babylonians than people who are going to live forever. Can you relate to that? Yeah, uh, I need to hear a word from Ezekiel today. I need to hear a word of hope because I also am in exile. I'm cut off, clean cut off because of my sin. So it isn't even just my family members I'm worried about. I got to worry about me. Can these bones live? Well, Ezekiel seems to have an answer. And Ezekiel's answer is, by the Spirit of God, what is dead will live. By the Spirit of God. Why do I say that? Well, it's made explicit in verse 14 of that reading. But earlier, it's like, you know, the, God says to Ezekiel, prophesy, first prophesy to the bones. And it's like, so he's got to preach to an entire congregation of people who are basically dead. And I, I, I've known preachers who could relate, but, uh, but I'm not saying I can relate to that this morning. Um, that's a joke. <laughs> it didn't work. That's why I didn't use it at early service. I knew it wasn't going to work. Um, no, Ezekiel's been given a, a word of prophecy first to these bones, but they come, they, 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 they sort of, they gather up flesh and sinew and muscle and skin, but they're not, they're not alive yet until the word of the Lord says to Ezekiel, now prophesy to the wind. Now, you may know if you've been around here a little while from my Bible classes that the Hebrew word ruach is the word for wind. The word ruach is also the word for breath. It's also the word for spirit. Same Hebrew word, three possible translations, and all three of them are in that text. And what, what Ezekiel is saying is, the, pro the, the prophecy of the Spirit, the deliverance of the Spirit, the arrival of the Spirit is life from death. Bones that are dead can live when they receive the Holy Spirit. And then you start to figure out what God is saying to me about these bones. And what God is saying to me about the bones of my loved ones. And what God is saying to me about this culture of death out there where it's nothing but a valley of very dry bones. People who do not know the Lord their God. People who do not have the Holy Spirit. People who are celebrating death. And yet God has breathed His Spirit into us. 
How do we know? Well, there was another valley of bones in the first century Jerusalem. I don't know why the history books don't record this. History, you can read a lot of first century history books and not one of them will indicate that on, on a certain day, a bunch of Jews gathered together in Jerusalem to do what they did every single year, the festival of weeks, the, what they called the Pentecost, what we call now Pentecost. And lo and behold, visibly, some miraculous thing took place. The Holy Spirit of God visibly descended and lighted on certain people who then began to prophesy life into dead people. People who had no business being alive. People from all over the world who had come, who knows why, but they certainly didn't know Jesus as their Messiah, risen from the dead as he was. But that day, why don't the history books report this? It happened that day. The Holy Spirit inspired the church to begin to prophesy that there is salvation in no other name but Jesus Christ. Christ. And through that prophecy, dead bones come to life. So, you've received that same Holy Spirit. It didn't happen all at one time for us like it did that first time in, in Jerusalem. It came to me a uh, January 10th, 1968. That was the day I was baptized. What day did it come to you? What day did the Holy Spirit come into your life and take dry, lifeless bones? I know I was probably not as lifeless as my parents. Maybe, <laughs> Maybe that's a little bit of work, but, <laughs> but you know what I mean. And I came to life that day, and I'm still alive. And by the Holy Spirit, I shall not die. And so I know what the prophecy is. I know the meaning of the, Isaiah, of the Ezekiel text. And I know what it means to people who, who are living the culture of death to be given a, a message of hope that says, oh, yes, there is lots of death here. But by the resurrection of Jesus Christ and by the reception of the Spirit, you too can live. And that's how we engage this culture of death. Not with a wagging finger of judgment. Oh, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead. But by a proclamation of life, the Holy Spirit can make you alive forever in Jesus Christ. It's nothing new. Adam and Eve have been do Adam and Eve started doing it right away. It's like I wish Genesis had given us a little bit more detail as to what happened to Adam and Eve after the whole episode with Cain and Abel, but it, it they just kind of disappear from the story. However, we do know exactly what Adam and Eve did. Who else do you think were, was telling the stories? Who else do you think knew what was going on in the garden before, before they were exiled? Only Adam and Eve could tell the story of Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and Genesis 3 and for that matter, Genesis 4. Only Adam and Eve. You know what that means? After they were exiled, they must have had the Spirit because they began to prophesy. And they began to tell everyone who would listen, their children and their children's children and their great-grandchildren and every... And they lived a good long life, those Adam and Eve. And they told every single generation that followed them that God had made them a promise. That the day would come when God would send his seed and he would stamp out death. And they prophesied. And because they prophesied, Moses could write it down. And because Moses wrote it down, Abraham could live what he lived. And, be, and, and because Abraham lived what he lived, Jacob and, and Esau and, 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 the, and the, the 12 tribes of Israel and the whole nation could live because they knew 
that the reason they existed was that through them would come life. Through them would come a Messiah. And it came. He came. He came waltzing into Jerusalem to do the very thing that Ezekiel prophesied. First, he became death. Jesus died. Uh, he, he was laid in a tomb. And so the question, <laughs> which, I mean, look, Ezekiel didn't have the law of thermodynamics, but he knew dry bones don't come to life. They didn't have the laws of thermodynamics in the first century either. You lay Jesus in the tomb, and he, he's gone. <laughs> Not. <laughs> Someone's over here prophesying. No, he's... Can these bones live? Yes. Christ is risen. And then he, he, he says to his disciples, look, now that, now that I have instituted an eternal life, I'm going to send my spirit into you and you're going to prophesy. Just like Joel said, your sons and daughters, they'll all become prophets. And now we know the strategy. Now we know why Jesus sends his spirit into this world, into this church. It's so that we have that same good news of hope. These bones, by the Spirit of God, will live. Amen. I invite the congregation to stand as we pray. O oh, gracious Lord, your spirit fills the world, gladdens your church with the remembrance of everything Christ Jesus has spoken. Glorify his name among us in every word and deed, Lord, in your mercy. Give hope to your people in the midst of this world of death and despair. 
Put your spirit within us to believe, to live, to serve, indeed, to prophesy according to your promises and commands. Lead our homes to confess our confidence in your power to raise the dead now and at the last day. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord God, be near to our president, our governor, and to all those you have set in place to govern our land. Do not let the ruler of this world govern them and their decisions to our harm, but give us instead the benefits of good government. Lord, in your mercy. We call on your name, O oh Lord, praying in the spirit to help and save all. Renew the face of the earth. Look with favor on your creatures. Fill the hearts of your faithful, kindling in them the fire of your love, Lord, in your mercy. Send your Holy Spirit upon your people so that convicted of their sin, they may also be convinced that the righteousness of Christ is theirs. And in repentance and faith, receive the forgiveness of sins. Unite us by your spirit of truth in faith and in confession and comfort us with the knowledge that this world's prince is judged. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Finally, Lord, comfort all those who grieve. Assure them that since Christ has gone away to the cross and has risen victorious over death, so also those who go away from us in this life will rise to everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Now remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you.